our best efforts to teach appropriate behavior and prevent student errors, there will inevitably be those students who continue to have problems. This module will discuss effective responses to the most common of these behaviors. Of course, there are no sure things when it comes to dealing with challenging behaviors. Nothing that works every time for every student. However, there are strategies that are known to provide the highest probability of positive outcomes. These will be the focus of this module. We'll focus this discussion on three specific and common misbehaviors, disrespect, disruption, and noncompliance, presenting each with examples provided by JCPS teachers. In this section, the focus is on disrespectful behaviors. These are those behaviors in which a student purposefully engages in order to show a lack of respect for another person or persons. It looks like I don't like to listen to you. Who are you? I think it's the language. <laughs> I think you're right, because I had a, a student two days ago tell me I was tripping. Disrespectful behavior is intended as a hostile action. To show another person a willingness to belittle, mock, or reject their standing or worthiness. Often disrespect is exhibited toward peers as a form of bullying. At other times, disrespect is directed at adults as a mean of provoking a confrontation. When directed toward students, disrespect is potentially dangerous because of the pain it can cause. However, disrespect toward adults is often reported by teachers to be among the misbehaviors that are most challenging because it's personal. To consider disrespectful behavior, Let's begin with what adults can do to prevent the likelihood of such behaviors in the first place. Now you're a lot of kids, I know, but bald You're head. dumb, bald headed granny. That's yes. their yes. big yes. thing. <laughs> and, then, and it's like they get so upset when you say that. Yeah. First, respect must be defined. One simple way of doing this is to associate respect with doing unto others as you would have them do unto you. This is a simple way to help students consider respect in any situation but specific examples from the natural environment will still be necessary. Think back to Module 4 and what we talked about with regard to teaching expectations. Managing disrespect starts with teaching what it means to be respectful. In addition to encouraging and acknowledging respectful interaction, teachers can greatly increase respect simply by consistently modeling respect in their own interactions with students. The initial response to disrespectful behavior is best done in as neutral a manner as possible. Because disrespect generally is a means of attention seeking, we don't want to generate more attention, but we also don't want it to be successful in removing the focus from instruction. A good first response is to talk to the student individually, indicate the behavior is disrespectful, and indicate a need to follow up after instruction. Regardless of how angry or personally offended you might be, it is critical that your response be an example of respectful interaction. Simply identify behavior as disrespectful and provide the standard consequence. But again, it's best not to do this in front of a group as it both provides attention and takes the focus off of instruction. Be careful not to overreact, leading to escalation of behavior. If the student continues to engage in disrespectful behavior, provide a single reminder, after which the student must be taken aside and spoken to personally and directly. The standard consequence can be repeated and the student should be offered a choice to engage in respectful behavior or choose to take a larger consequence. Once there is a time for a longer interaction, the teacher can discuss apologies or other restitution as appropriate. But this is not something that is generally effective at the time a student is being disrespectful or when in front of an audience of peers. Let's take a look at a video scenario involving disrespectful behavior. As you watch, think about the keys to addressing disrespect and see if you can spot times that the teacher makes errors in response to this student's behavior. Ugh. Cameron, I am not gonna allow you to be disrespectful like that. Then don't be so boring. <laughs> okay, any more of that, you're gonna leave the room. At least I don't have to listen to you. Get out. Oh, so sad, I have to listen to Miss Boring. <laughs> all right, all right, you all calm down. Let's get back to work. Discuss how the teacher handled this situation. In light of the keys that have been presented, make a list of the things you think the teacher could or should have done differently to increase the probability of this student's respectful interactions. 
In your team discussion, you probably noted that the teacher broke the first rule of dealing with disrespect and took it very personally. Because the teacher argued, a power struggle ensued, and the student can always win a battle of disrespect. It would have been better to not allow the power struggle to occur in the first place. Overall, the challenge as an argument took time away from the instruction, which likely reinforced this student's use of disrespect. Let's take a look at how the teacher might have handled this in a much more effective manner. Okay, remember that you're working on the questions in this uh, text. Whoa. Make sure you're answering them correctly. Cameron, that was very disrespectful, and I think you know that. So we're going to talk about that later after class, okay? I don't understand how it's disrespectful for me to yawn because I'm bored. And that's, that's part of the reason why we're going to talk after class, okay? So let's get back to work right now. Thank you. Good job. In this version, the teacher was cool, calm, and collected, being very direct and businesslike with the student. In addition, the teacher let the student know that the behavior was unacceptable and indicated follow-up after class. As a result, the incident was quickly addressed and instruction resumed. In this section, the focus is on disruptive behaviors. These are behaviors that, purposefully or not, disrupt the learning environment or otherwise prevent or interfere with other students' ability to follow directions and maintain their learning. To get him to say, okay, Ms. McDermott's acting silly right now, but she's, I'm also de-escalating him. And I'm also bringing him back from whatever he was thinking about, wherever he was going towards that street, to say, okay, you know, she's, she's a person too. She's not just my teacher. She's not the one that talked crazy to me. So let me bring it back to the person that I care about and, and be, be present in that moment with my emotions instead of off wherever he was about to go. So I think that helps just being able to say, you're not the only one that has this going on. Our kids in my building, they do that behavior in order to get out of class. Exactly. So Can't if I go them. in and I do, you know, the Who Squad and come in and get the kid and go, mm -hmm. all of a sudden they're like, yes, I'm out of reading. Mm -hmm. However, if I can go in and this kid like just called you whatever, I can sit down with them and have a conversation right there in the classroom, come up with, you know, restitution, I need you to do this, I need you to do this. And what is it that you think needs to happen next? Well, I'm going to say I'm sorry. Yes, you are. And so they can go say they're sorry, and we don't leave the classroom. So that behavior did not get what they wanted. They're attention seeking. So I'm trying to think of the behaviors they externalize. It's like, you know, if they have their hand raised, but you don't pick on them, and they're like, they have the outburst, or, you know, you don't, you don't want me, or you don't, you know, but they constantly are seeking your attention, and they have to be right at your hip, and they have to have that constant affirmation from you to know that they're doing well. And they don't like to see it if other kids get it, and that's what is what triggers it. For many, the term disruptive behavior conjures up thoughts of severe or even dangerous behaviors. While these certainly do occur, most disruptions are fairly mild. It's the frequency that is problematic. Because the disruptive behavior distracts others from learning, they are often reported by teachers to be among the most challenging misbehaviors. The fact that disruptions are distracting to others also makes them difficult to ignore. Disruptive behavior generally serves a function for the student. If the function is to garner attention from others, disruption generally works very well. Nothing gets peer attention like doing something to disrupt the learning environment. If disruption is the result of frustration, then the student is likely to continue as the function serves as both a cathartic effect for the student and allows him or her to avoid work, as disruptions tend to take the focus off of academics. To consider disruptions, let's begin with what adults can do to prevent the likelihood of such behaviors in the first place. As with all behavior problems, teaching appropriate behavior provides the best chance for prevention. There are two keys to this instruction. The first is teaching the student what to do and under what conditions to do it. In this case, it involves teaching students to seek attention or handle frustration in a more appropriate manner. The second key to instruction is to consider function or why the student engages in disruptive behavior. Effective instruction must focus on teaching the student an effective alternative behavior that serves the same function as the disruption. If the student is disruptive to gain peer attention, then we can teach appropriate ways to get attention. If the function of behavior is to avoid work, we can teach appropriate ways to ask for assistance or a break. Importantly, 
This involves teaching those behaviors directly, providing modeling and an engaging discussion. However, the key to success is in avoiding the triggers for disruption by creating an environment that reminds and invites appropriate behavior with consistent routines, teacher proximity, and frequent reminders. Of course, some students may continue or escalate disruptive behavior despite effective instruction and consistent consequences. When this happens, there are some key considerations for addressing the problem. Let's take a look at these keys and then watch a video of a student engaged in disruption. The initial response to disruption must occur immediately upon noticing agitation. Recall that agitation is the last chance to stop behavior before it escalates to a peak. The first response should be to provide one very specific direction for the student to engage in the alternative behavior that has been taught. As with most responses to misbehavior, this direction must be concrete, simple, and a step toward a larger and more appropriate behavior in order to maximize the probability of success. If the student complies, then positive acknowledgement is warranted. Considering how to help the student to access either attention or assistance. If the student does not comply, the teacher should speak as privately as possible with the student, indicating how the behavior is a problem for the student, not a problem for the teacher. This might include reminding the student that his or her behavior will result in a consequence and present them with a choice or options for changing their behavior to avoid the consequence. Once the choice has been presented, the teacher should move away briefly so as not to force a more heated confrontation, then come back to the student and ask about their choice. If there is something the teacher can do to help jumpstart the student into the appropriate behavior, this is a good time to provide such assistance. In the end, however, whether the student complies is his or her decision, and the consequences must be presented as their own choice. Finally, because disruptions are distracting to others, it is important for the teacher to continue attending to and acknowledging others, helping to refocus attention away from disruptive students. As always, when the student complies, there is a positive consequence, and when he or she does not, there is a negative consequence, each presented as the student's choice. Take a look at a video scenario involving disruptive behavior. As you watch, think about the keys to addressing disruption and see if you can spot times that the teacher makes errors in response to this student's behavior. Okay, so you're gonna write the name of the restaurant, you get at least three reasons, and you explain each reason, okay? You know what to do, directions are on the board, get busy. Stop tapping, that's annoying. My, my, mind your own business. Stop. Okay, not appropriate. You know it, and I know you know it. Wait, get busy. Problem? Yeah. Okay, you're not doing this today. Okay, you're not going to disrupt us today. Not happening. I'm going to call and have you removed. I already know the way. Go yourself. Don't walk out that door. You can't go without an escort. Discuss how the teacher handled the situation. In light of the keys that have been presented, make a list of things you think the teacher could or should have done differently to increase the probability of this student's compliance. In your team discussion, you probably noted that the student was clearly agitated upon entry to the classroom. But instead of remaining calm, the teacher lashed out at the student, resulting in an immediate escalation. In addition, the teacher's constant talking across the room and inability to provide effective redirection simply fed into the escalation. Let's take a look at how the teacher might have handled this in a much more effective manner. All right, you're writing about your favorite restaurant. You need to tell why. There's three reasons why you like that place, okay? You need to explain each reason, all right? Your directions are on the board. You're busy. Stop tapping, that's annoying. Mind your own business. Yeah, that's really annoying. You mind your you own business. Stop. You mind your own business too. Okay. Where's the paper you had yesterday? In here somewhere. Can we find it? What's your favorite restaurant? Yeah. 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 I don't know if you do it. Okay. Okay. I can take that. Okay. Get my paper? Yeah. Okay. All right, why don't you get it out? Tell me your reason why you like this restaurant. 
Okay. okay. Yeah. Some nice place. Nice place. All right. Super. Mm-hmm. It's expensive. Oh yeah, that's a reason to like it. Okay. No. <laughs> Might not be a reason your mom likes it. It's good. It's um has good people. Okay. Good service. Yes. Yeah. Okay. All right. You can write that. All right. Yeah. All you need to do is explain those, right? Yeah. Okay. Better. Yeah. I think I gotta take a deep breath and start over, huh? Yeah. You good? Yeah. All right. You need any more help? You let me know, okay? Okay. All right. Thanks. Good job. Good choice. In this version, the teacher recognized the student early and moved to speak privately rather than across the room. In addition, the teacher continued to provide specific directions and did not attend to misbehavior. This allowed the teacher to also express a concern for the student and offer to help. Section, the focus is on non-compliant behaviors. These are those behaviors that involve a student's failure or refusal to follow directions. If you work in a school, then you're familiar with non-compliance. These behaviors might be as simple as feigning ignorance and being slow to respond, or as serious as outright defiance and refusal to comply with teacher directions. Schools have different terms for these behaviors. Defiance, insubordination, not following directions, and non-compliance. These all mean the same thing. The student is not doing as they have been directed. I'm not gonna do it. I don't wanna do it. So then you kind of ignore them and then they'll like uh, verbally like intimidate or make fun of you or something. And they're just trying to bait you into that verbal back and forth. And sometimes just questions. Like I know we have students that will just raise their hand and they'll ask you a question about, you know, you're in the middle of this great, wonderful, you know, writing instruction and they'll raise your hand and say, um, or raise their hand and say, you know, ask you something random about Red Ribbon Week next week. And you're like, what are you, we're not even talking about Red Ribbon Week next week, you know? Um, and it's like, or, or they'll, um, um, just raise their hand and want to go to the bathroom during the middle of instruction yes. three or four times, you know, those kinds of things. While some very minor instances of non-compliance can be ignored, ignoring the student that purposefully defies directions sends a message to all students that teacher directions are not always worthy of attention. Further, small instances of non-compliance, when not addressed properly, tend to grow into larger, more serious, and more frequent episodes. To consider non-compliant behavior, let's begin with what adults can do to prevent the likelihood of such behaviors in the first place. As with all behavior problems, teaching appropriate behavior provides the best chance for prevention. Effective instruction for compliance is best done with all students in the class, teaching an expectation for following teacher directions. This should be done at the start of the year so that students know from the beginning what the expectations are. Effective teaching involves teacher modeling and is done so in a manner that engages the students in a discussion. As the year goes by, the teacher will learn how best to provide reminders in those times and with those students who most need them. Finally, compliance is most likely when students are recognized for even the simplest instances of compliance and are corrected for instances of non-compliance. Regardless of how well you teach and remind, there will always be students who are non-compliant or who are very slow and half-hearted in response to directions. In these cases, there are strategies we can use to increase the probability of gaining compliance. As with other misbehaviors, responses should be done privately as much as possible so as not to provide undue attention and distract other students. However, it is important to continue to acknowledge students that are on task and complying. Non-compliant students should be addressed with a single direction. Tell them exactly what you need to see from them. These students often will have several reasons why it's not possible or reasonable to follow the directions, but we should be a broken record and keep repeating the direction. It's helpful here to simply say that we're willing to help with all other issues and problems, but first the student needs to follow the first direction. When a direction has been followed, we can provide assistance and then make a follow-up request, each new request being another step in full compliance with the task at hand. In the end, either the student complies and receives a nod of thanks, or does not and receives the standard consequence. Let's take a look at a video scenario involving non-compliant behavior. As you watch, 
Think about the keys to addressing noncompliance and see if you can spot the times that the teacher makes errors in response to this student's behavior. Class? Yes! Class, class? Yes, yes! All right, it's time to start our letters. You have 20 minutes. I'm going to start the timer now. Please begin. Sydney, get out your paper and get started. I don't understand. <laughs> We've discussed it. You know the assignment. Get started. I don't have a paper. I gave everyone a paper. You do have a paper. Get it out and get started. I don't have a pencil. You have a pencil in your desk. Get it out and get started. I'm not using this. You are going to use it or you're going to get a zero. I'll go to my locker then. No, sit down and use the pencil and the paper that I gave you and get started. Bye. Discuss how the teacher handled the situation. In light of the keys that have been presented, make a list of things you think the teacher could or should have done differently to increase the probability of this student's compliance. In your team discussion, you probably noted that the teacher's conversation with the student was done mostly across the room, dragging in other students as spectators. But mostly, the teacher was simply arguing with the student, allowing the student to lead the discussion and continue avoiding work. In the end, the conflict escalated to the point that the student simply raised the stakes in order to get kicked out of class. Let's take a look at how the teacher might have handled this in a much more effective manner. Class? Yes! Class, class? Yes, yes! Time to get started on our letters. We've gone over the directions. Does anybody have any questions? No, no, no. All right, go ahead and get started. You have 20 minutes. Sydney, why are you not started? I don't understand. If you go ahead and get your paper out and go ahead and write your greeting, I'll come over and help you with the directions. I don't have a pencil. If you have a pencil on your desk, please get it out and get started. I, I don't want to use this. Okay, if you'll get a paper out, go ahead and get started, start on your greeting, I'll go find you a better pencil. Does that work? Sounds good. Do you have a question about the assignment? Yes. Okay, what do you not understand? Well, I wasn't here for the If I gave you an example, would it help? A couple students said that they weren't a fan of Thanksgiving because you eat leftovers for a week and they don't even like turkey, so that was their least favorite. Okay, so can you, can you think of something? One of the holidays, it can be any holiday, and you write about what is your least favorite tradition of that holiday. Does that, does that make sense? Go ahead and get started. You probably noticed that in this version, the teacher remained calm and stuck with a repeated, single, simple direction to get student compliance. Once the student followed an initial direction, the teacher provided another single direction that continued the student on in the direction of being compliant with a larger set of expectations. Here's a task for you to consider. Think about students you have had or currently have in your classroom that have problems with disrespectful, disruptive, or non-compliant behavior and consider the following. What pre-teaching is in place regarding this problem? Does this behavior result in increased peer or adult attention or the stopping of instruction? Which of the keys for addressing this behavior have you tried when confronted with it in the school?